Yay! So now we're done discussing the clinical description for OCD as well as the psychodynamic, cognitive, and behavioral explanations for why we develop OCD. Now let's look at the biological and genetic explanation. So we know from studies that there is a 53% concordance rate for identical twins and 23% for fraternal twins. That means most likely OCD has strong genetic links. However, if we talk about uh, the neurobiological aspect of OCD, we also know that it's linked to low serotonin activity as well as uh, glutamate, GABA, and dopamine issues. We're just not sure, not really sure what interactions are going on. We just know those chemicals are involved. Particularly if we talk about brain structure and function, the main components that scientists see when they're studying OCD is that there seems to be something wrong with the worry circuit of the brain. And that has to do with these four parts. The orbitofrontal cortex, which is the front part, frontal lobe, at the frontal lobe, right above your eye. And your cingulate gyrus. And then your caudate nucleus and your thalamus. So the illustration presents those four parts. And so what happens is that these four parts communicate when there is something wrong. Okay, so if you look at the lines, possible lines nila, you have the orbital frontal context, the cortex, the part of your brain says something, oops, 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 oops. The, the brain observes something from the environment and then realizes something is off, something is wrong. Whoops, something is wrong. So the orbital frontal cortex alerts the brain, the rest of the brain. And then the cingulate gyrus is involved with inducing anxiety. It activates anxiety as a mechanism to help prepare the brain and the body to address the problem. So the cingulate gyro, gyro starts to say, oh no, oh no, oops, hello. And then the caudate nucleus is supposed to be the part that tells the, the double checks and tells the rest of the brain, okay, uh, not really big deal, it's okay, it's okay, we can all calm down and you can go back to your normal functioning. Okay. However, if the caudate nucleus doesn't do that, the message from the orbitofrontal cortex and the anxiety uh, that's arisen from the cingulate gyrus will be communicated to the thalamus. And the thalamus will order you to do something about it, to cope with what is happening in your cingulate gyrus. So what's going to happen is your body will perform a compulsion and then that's only when you start to feel better. But then you're also training your worry circuit that that is the sequence and that's what you should do to feel better. Okay. So as for treatments, the most effective is behavioral therapy where we use uh, exposure and response prevention or ERP. It's a behavioral treatment where you actually, what you actually do is, for example, if the person is afraid of dying because of germs, what you have the person do is show him a lababo filled with dirty dishes Okay, and if the person has compulsions of cleaning, so when a person sees something dirty like that, there's that worry, and so the person has to perform rituals, hours and hours of washing the dishes. What you're supposed to do as a therapist is help the person not perform the compulsive behavior. Okay, so you're going to you're supposed to resist cleaning the dishes. You just you have to get used to the idea of dirty dishes being there. 
safety and realize that you're actually still pretty safe. You're not gonna die because of dirty dishes. So once you unlearn that unhealthy pattern of believing something and then the need to perform a ritual to counteract that, that's when you start recovering from OCD. So sometimes your your OCD uh, is linked to anxiety symptoms or depressive symptoms, especially if your OCD affects a lot of things in your life, a lot of relationships and a lot of activities in your life. So you may use SSRIs, but you will have to also take note of how long you will use them and whether the, the, you're getting the right dose. Okay? And then once you start, you should not stop just about when you feel better because then it's going to be worse when you relapse another one would be cognitive therapy so in cognitive therapy the the psychologist will teach you that just having a thought is not equal to actually performing a bad or a negative behavior so for example if you had a, the persistent thought of wanting to kiss people in the lips that is not the same as actually going out and kissing people on the lips. So you don't have to worry about performing rituals to stop yourself from thinking that way. Okay, So that's cognitive therapy. So if you combine that with exposure and response prevention, uh, so you, you, you focus on the, the unlearning of the guilt, and the shame and at the same time you also unlearn the connection between the obsession and the compulsion through ERP you are using a cognitive behavioral approach okay so if you if you theorize naman that the problem is psychodynamic then you use free association so you, meaning you talk about you talk about random things and the therapist will try to come up with an explanation for what that means and help you develop insight into your thoughts from your unconscious so you can actually then let go of the the unwanted thoughts that you have been thinking about so here are some other disorders we're not gonna really we don't have a lot of material on this but just to introduce to you some other disorders one is trichotillomania uh, and here what you the the main feature is that you're pulling your hair resulting to considerable hair loss okay so it's not just like you're pulling one piece or two pieces of your two strands of your hair it's really more severe so this is an example this is rebecca brown she's a youtuber and she talks about her trichotillomania and how she tries to control it and tries to recover from it okay so yeah so you can sometimes people with trichotillomania most often they do it on the hair on their heads but sometimes they do it on their the hair on their arms uh pubic hair included and sometimes even their eyebrows and their eyelashes so practically anywhere that there's hair okay so another important consideration is that they should have made attempts to stop but their attempts failed and if it causes clinically significant distress and impairment just like other things so so let's say, for example, if you have a dermatological condition, so if you're, you lose hair, like if you have alopecia, obviously that's not trichotillomania because you're just losing hair because of another disease or another disorder. Okay? So for example, if you have body dysmorphic disorder, which is a condition that we'll, all, we'll be talking about in the uh, later part, then you rule out body dysmorphic disorder first okay so usually what happens with patients with trick is that 
they tend to pull out their hair when they're feeling stressed or when they're feeling anxious and then it results to a bald spot or multiple bald spots on their head if you're interested go check out rebecca brown's youtube channel another one is hoarding disorder so i don't know if you've seen the tv show hoarders i'm not i don't remember what channel that is it's a foreign channel but but it's actually also shown on youtube uh, and here the main feature is that you have difficulty discarding or parting with possessions regardless of actual value so you might wonder mom what the, what about collectors what if i like to collect things that's fine okay so of course um part of being having hoarding disorder would mean that you have to have a lot of stuff right but it's it's a disorder because you are experiencing dysfunction and distress as a result of the things that you have at home because very often it's not so much that you're collecting things it's really more of you don't want to let go of things that you really need to let go now so what you do is you have difficulty because you feel you need to salvage or you need to save the items and when you are forced to let go of them you experience such strong distress okay. so what you do is that they congest inside your home they accumulate inside your home and they clutter the active living areas so take note active living area so meaning if i'm storing things in my garage or in my stock room that's not necessarily an active living area it was made for storage right but if it's an active living area such as your bedroom or your living room or your kitchen then that is a problem so if you can no longer use them like some hoarders have items all over their beds or all over their kitchen counters or in their CR so they can't even find where their actual pillows are because there are so many things okay um, there are hoarders that hoard animals so they don't want to let go of animals even when they know they can't take care of them or feed them so they have like poop everywhere they have they find dead animals under their couch pretty much like that so some hoarders the really more extreme ones like they have their baby diapers from their babies and now their kids are grown up so they still have that too they have all sorts of things that are dirty rotting and yet they don't wanna let go of them okay but then again not all hoarders are the same or equal some express their hoarding in different uh, ways but the main thing that you need to look at is that a hoarder accumulates and accumulates and does not want to part with the possessions even when obviously the possession is no longer usable okay and then another one is body dysmorphic disorder in body dysmorphic disorder you believe you have a flaw on your appearance physical appearance but nobody seems to notice it so the idea is you actually don't have anything wrong on your face but you just think that there's something there okay so what that what you do is that you continuously obsess over that perceived flaw on your face you check in the mirror you try as much as possible to put on all sorts of creams all sorts of medications to to keep it from getting worse supposedly and then sometimes you also pick your skin or you ask people if like they see something or if you look okay and yet you can never be consoled by the fact that they say you look okay or you look beautiful okay? so sometimes what you do also is that you compare yourself to other people hello and then again this is not your normal social comparison this is really something that causes you significant distress and impairment so distress such as like 
you choose not to leave your house because you feel so ashamed of yourself because you're so ugly that's an example and then this function because you don't want to meet with your friends you you start to fail in class because you don't want to go to school because you feel people will just laugh at you okay so yeah so because you have a fear of being criticized for your physical appearance you choose to hide out and avoid people and not interact with them okay so that's body dysmorphic disorder the last one is excoriation or dermatillomania so this is just like trichotillomania except that instead of hair here you're picking at your skin so a common sign of this would be people with a lot of scabs or people with a lot of wounds on their skin okay so there are significant sores or wounds so again just like trichotillomania you've tried to stop yourself from picking at your skin but you just keep doing it okay so again it's not caused by substance use such as cocaine which can cause uh, wounds and scabs and scars or it should not be caused by another medical condition such as scabies okay and usually what happens also is you pick your skin when you're anxious or when you're stressed okay so that's it for obsessive compulsive disorders